Four rating. Well, we're waiting for everyone. Um, do you guys have any questions about previous material? Okay. <laughs> no. Floating around the room is a sign-in sheet, which you guys are obviously used to by now. Um, there is also three sheets you need to pick up from a big stack that's wherever. There is a mock test uh, for your exam on Friday, mock test number one. There is a key to that mock test. I don't suggest you fill in the key before you try and take the test yourself. I think I did a little bit better job in try two of hitting topics closer, especially as we get into test two and three. And then there is a sheet that we're going to use when we get to chapter four today. We're going to go fast. We're going to cover chapters three and four today because I want to make sure you have everything for your final. Um, we should have plenty of time to get through both, um, but we are going to be cooking today. So if I have to stop some questions and then take them at the end, we will do that. We understand? All right. Uh, also, most of the biochem stuff is now posted on one of my Google Drives. Um, so within the next week when I get it all finalized, I'm going to send you guys a link so you'll have access to all of these sheets that I pass out, all of the mock tests. Um, I won't be printing them and bringing them anymore. I'll try and email you guys or maybe I'll print them and bring them. But that way you have access to them at home. You can get ahead of it. You have the mock tests when you need it, et cetera, et cetera. All right. I'm going to get started. We still good or are we waiting on people still? Okay. Well, thank you. Sorry to rush you guys. I just want to make sure we get through everything. So we talked about fatty acid oxidation, beta oxidation of fatty acids. We talked about um, fatty acid biosynthesis. What is the final product of the beta oxidation of fatty acids? Acetyl-CoA. And what is the building block uh, in fatty acid biosynthesis? Acetyl-CoA, which turns into malonyl-CoA through the rate-limiting enzyme, which is acetyl-CoA carboxylase, how we get a two-carbon acetyl-CoA to a three-carbon malonyl-CoA. Um, so this chapter we're dealing with cholesterol. Guess what? The basic building block of cholesterol is acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA composes all 27 carbon units of cholesterol. And you're like, why is there 27 units when acetyl-CoA is two carbons? We're going to get to that. We're going to deal with the synthesis pathway. But for now, we're on page number something. Page number 28 or 27, if you have a different manual, apparently. And we're going to be dealing with some basic definitions, going through kind of the overview as we get through this. So, cholesterol is essential component of membranes, the outer layer of plasma lipoproteins, blood lipoproteins, et cetera, et cetera. That's fantastic. Great. Um, you need to know this. Cholesterol esters. Notice the YL there. Cholesterol esters are the storage form. A cholesterol ester is a cholesterol that's esterified with a fatty acid. A cholesterol that's esterified with a fatty acid. Cool. Thank you. Um, it's a cholesterol ester. It's how we store them. I'm going to show you where here in a minute. Um, their major constituents of cholesterol is a major constituent of gallstones, bile acids, steroids, vitamin D. The one you want to remember from this especially is steroids and vitamin D fat-soluble vitamins, and your steroid hormones, which are all of your testosterone, estrogen, pre progesterone, pregnolone, all that stuff. These make up the basic, of your basic building blocks of your steroid hormones. This cholesterol ring we're synthesizing is what's going to go into steroid hormones. So when we synthesize and we talk about cholesterol biosynthesis, it's very important horm hormonally and for the synthesis of our own vitamin D. Um, so several, yeah, whatever. This is the basic cholesterol form right here. This is called a phenethine ring structure. Don't need to know that. What I want you to notice is that here at position three is the only OH group. What are OHs good at? Letting go of water and therefore attaching to other stuff. OHs and Os make great binding sites. We can glycosylate, we can esterify, we can et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is the only place anything can bind to cholesterol. Position three, the hydroxyl group, is the only place anything can bind to a cholesterol molecule. There is no other great binding site on there. 
Now, this is where we esterify it. If we want to make cholesterol ester, which I'm going to drill into you, is the storage form, we esterify a fatty acid right here. We get a cholesterol, and the YL comes from the acyl group, ester, because there's an ester bond between the acyl group and the cholesterol. Cholesterol. You guys get that? So, cholesterol, position three, hydroxyl group, only place we can attach something to a cholesterol. Cholesterol esters are the, ster the storage form, and it's a fatty acyl esterified to a cholesterol. Um, and again here, biofilm membranes, steroid hormones, et cetera, et cetera. There's your phenothrene ring structure versus your cholesterol st uh, structure. Phenothrene ring is just the basic ring structure. Cholesterol is the full 27 carbons with the branch on it. Don't need to know the structures, et cetera, et cetera. Sources of cholesterol, uh, dietary cholesterol and endogenous cholesterol. You need to know these numbers. Dietarily, we get it from animal products. You don't make cholesterol in plants. There is a different thing that you're going to study in nutrition. It's called er ergosterol, which is written up there if you care. Um, but you don't get cholesterol from plants. So it's only animal products, which is why ten vegetarians and vegans tend to have a lower cholesterol profile than do carnivores. So egg yolks, meats. Um, red meat especially, et cetera, et cetera. We are red meat, so anything that makes cholesterol has a bunch of cholesterol in it. Your dietary cholesterol input is supposed to be about 300 milligrams a day. To give you an idea, that's like two eggs. So it's not much. But about 300 milligrams a day, you need to know that. That's the RDA of cholesterol. But if you look down here, low sources of sterols or cholesterols produce, cause endogenous, stim stimulate endogenous production. Low dietary sources stimulate endogenous production, endogenous synthesis. Liver and the intestines are the primary places that produce it. The liver produces about 1,000 milligrams a day, TQ. The liver produces about 1,000 milligrams a day of cholesterol. Um, normal average blood level of cholesterol, you need to know, is 180 to 200 milligrams per deciliter. In the next chapter, we're going to talk about four primary, well, we're going to talk about the blood cholesterols, which are extra lipoproteins. But you're supposed to have about 180 to 200 milligrams per deciliter. And you've heard that. When someone goes to the doctor, they test your total cholesterol, and your total cholesterol is supposed to be under 200 milligrams per deciliter. That's that number right there. You've got to know all three. Now, my argument is we're supposed to get 300 a day in our diet, and our liver produces 1,000 based on our dietary intake. So our liver should be able to downregulate and produce less cholesterol if you exceed that capacity. We want 1.3 grams of cholesterol a day. Now, that's not saying you can eat as much cholesterol as you want, but I eat a lot more than two eggs a day, and I have very good cholesterol. So it's not purely if you go over 300 milligrams a day, you have dietary or you have high cholesterol. It's a combination of what your liver produces, because as you can see, your liver is a much bigger player in this than the diet is supposed to be, what you dietarily intake and everything else you do in your life. Cool? Any questions on that stuff? Just the numbers you got to memorize? We're going to skip this. This is chapter four. We're going to go through this in detail. Again, like I told you, this was in chapter one or two. This is all chapter four. It doesn't make much sense now, but once I get through chapter four, you can skim back through this stuff, and it's going to be a breeze to read through. I think the whole next page is as well. Yep, same thing with this page. This thing is all chapter four. We're on to page number 31. This diagram is chapter four as well. That's what we're going to be going through in chapter four. So down here, at the bottom of page number 31, cholesterol biosynthesis occurs in the cytosol. Do you think that's important? Yes, TQ. What else occurs in the cytosol that we've studied this trimester? Biosynthesis of fatty acids. What occurs in the mitochondria? Beta oxidation of fatty acids. Good. It needs hydrolysis of high energy ATP. That's all you care about. You want the ATP and acetyl-CoA, because acetyl-CoA is the building block of cholesterol, acetyl-CoA is the building block of fatty acids. So acetyl-CoA is going to be really important for cholesterol biosynthesis. And this is important as well. Acetyl-CoA or acetate, what's acetate? Nice, it's a ketone body which is made of, what's the building block of ketone bodies? Acetyl-CoA. Remember when you have a bunch of acetyl-CoA, our body converts it to ketone bodies. So acetyl-CoA or acetate, which is a bunch of acetyl-CoA's, two acetyl-CoA's, is the source of all 27 carbon units. If it's the source of all 27 carbon units, it must be really important for cholesterol biosynthesis. We must need both acetyl-CoA and ATP to make cholesterol. Acetyl-CoA and ATP to make cholesterol. 
So make sure you know that source of all 27 carbon units. No carbons come from anything from but acetyl-CoA. Now we have some sources of acetyl-CoA. Where can we get it? Beta oxidation of fatty acids, whether it's endogenously produced fatty acid. What is the endogenously produced fatty acid, the basic fatty acid that all humans produce? Palmitic acid, palmitate, how many carbons does it have? 16. So if we want to make cholesterol, if we need to make cholesterol or steroid hormones or vitamin D or whatever, we can break down our fatty acids, we can get acetyl-CoA. We can also break down glucose, get it into the mitochondria, ship it out through the citrate transporter, you guys remember that, and get acetyl-CoA out in the cytosol because cholesterol biosynthesis occurs in the cytosol. So we can break down glucose to get acetyl-CoA as well, um, and ketogenic amino acids because as we're going to talk about in Chapter 6, a ketogenic amino acid is an amino acid that breaks down into a ketone body. And ketone bodies are made of acetyl-CoA. Everything we've talked about this tri is made of freaking acetyl-CoA. So ketone body, ketogenic amino acids break down into ketones, and they can produce cholesterol, or they can produce acetyl-CoA, therefore they can produce cholesterol or fat. Same thing if he asks you the sources of acetyl-CoA for fatty acid biosynthesis or cholesterol biosynthesis, it's just how do you get acetyl-CoA. Since this is a biosynthetic reductive pathway, what coenzyme do we use? Since this is a biosynthetic reductive pathway, what coenzyme do we use? Biosynthetic reductive uses NADPH. Remember the biochem pearl. All biosynthetic reductive pathways use NADPH. It's reductive, so you know you need a reducing equivalent. You need one of the H versions. Those are our reducing equivalents to reduce this pathway. And the one that donates its, its hydrogen for biosynthetic processes is NADPH. So we need sources of NADPH. What are the two sources of NADPH? PPP, a.k.a. HMP shunt. And what did we learn last week? The malic enzyme reaction, which is taking that OAA back into the mitochondria. Good. Nice job, guys. So two sources of NADPH, the pentose phosphate pathway, or HMP shunt, and the malic enzyme reaction which we taught you last week. All right, now screw this. We're going to go to uh, my fancy little diagram. You guys all have this, hopefully. If not, see me after, write it down. Um, so, this is how we make cholesterol. Good news is you don't need to know most of the enzymes. You need to know three enzymes in cholesterol biosynthesis, and I'm going to show you what three enzymes those are. This first step is not cholesterol biosynthesis. This first step is not cholesterol biosynthesis. Going from acetyl-CoA plus acetyl-CoA to, to acetoacetyl-CoA, that's ketone body synthesis. This is acetoacetate or acetoacetyl-CoA because instead of just being a... a, a conjugate base over here, it's attached to a CoA. That's ketone body synthesis. That's an enzyme we use in ketone body synthesis, thiolase. It's called thiolase because normally it cleaves this at a thiol bond and produces two acetyl-CoAs. It's a lase because it's cleaving, so it's named for working in the reverse direction. That's the precursor step to this. Now this step, th this process is incredibly cyclical. You're going to get really sick of me saying this stuff. So we take two acetyl-CoAs and we get how many carbons right here? Four carbons, acetoacetyl-CoA. Now I'm going to take two more acetyl-CoAs and I'm going to slap them on there. And you saw this enzyme before, HMG-CoA synthase. It produces HMG-CoA. I told you that this was important both in ketone body synthesis and in cholesterol biosynthesis. Make sure you know that, that HMG-CoA or HMG-CoA synthase is involved in both ketone body synthesis and cholesterol biosynthesis. HMG-CoA synthase is a synthase that makes HMG-CoA. It's a synthase because it doesn't use ATP. If it used ATP, it would be a synthetase. So HMG-CoA synthase makes HMG-CoA by adding a third acetyl-CoA. So we take two acetyl-CoAs, thiolase makes them acetoacetyl-CoA. We take another acetyl-CoA, HMG-CoA synthase makes it HMG-CoA, which stands for something horrible. Yes. Hydroxymethylglutyryl-CoA. Don't need to know it. HMG-CoA. Makes HMG-CoA. Oh, it's right there. <laughs> Hydroxymethylglutyryl-CoA. Uh, I don't need to know it for Dr. Sarkar. Maybe recognize it, but you can see it's obviously HMG. 
So this is the first enzyme of cholesterol biosynthesis. Not a big TQ, just understand that's where it starts. When I say I, I want you to know three enzymes of cholesterol biosynthesis and we're going to skip the rest, that's one of the first ones you need to know. You need to know that HMG CoA synthase takes an acetoacetyl CoA and an acetyl CoA and makes them HMG CoA. It's a six carbon unit, we've got our first thing. Now, this is the rate limiting enzyme for cholesterol biosynthesis. Do you think it's important? Yeah. Fantastic. You guys are kicking, uh, learn. So, HMG CoA synthase makes HMG CoA. The rate limiting enzyme is HMG CoA reductase. What do you think it does to HMG CoA? Reduces it. So, what does it need? NADPH, because it's a reductive biosynthetic process. It's going to take two NADPH and it's going to turn HMG CoA into mavolinate. Mavolinate. How many carbons is mavolinate? Six. We didn't change anything. We didn't carboxylate. We didn't decarboxylate. It's just the rate limiting enzyme. Please know that the rate limiting enzyme in this case starts with an R. It's not the S one. The rate limiting enzyme is the reductase, not the synthase. Rate limiting enzyme, reductase. Takes HMG CoA, turns it into mavolinate by reducing it. So make sure you know it's a reductase enzyme, which means it needs a reducing equivalent. And if it has a reducing equivalent, it's going to be reducing the substrate or oxidizing NADPH. I doubt he'll ask that, but just in case. Now, funny little step in between. Don't need to know it too much. You're going to see right here, mavolinate turns into mavolinate diphosphate, which means we need some ATP donors. Um, not a big deal. You don't need to know the enzyme there. But for the next, like, six steps, this is going to stay a diphosphate version. And then towards the end, we're going to cleave off the diphosphates. Again, he's not going to ask you the difference between mavolinate and mavolinate diphosphate and what steps they are and stuff like that. I just want you to know the structures so you've seen them. So we take mavolinate and we turn it into isoprene by decarboxylating it. We turn it into isoprene by decarboxylating it. If we decarboxylate, decarboxylate mavolinate, which is six carbons, we end up with isoprene, which is five carbons. This is our basic structural unit for cholesterol biosynthesis. Now here's where we can start to get fun. So we take two acetyl-CoA's, combine them. We take a third acetyl-CoA, make a six carbon molecule. We take that six carbon molecule, we turn it into a five carbon molecule, we have isoprene. Then we go back to the beginning and do it again and we now we have another five carbon molecule. We take those two five carbon molecules and we stick them together and we get a ten carbon molecule. That's geronosyl, which is isoprene plus isoprene. Now, I wrote an intermediate step in here because this is a quick intermediate step it does. Just like in gluconeogenesis or glycolysis, we go from fructose 1,6-bisphosphate to DHAP and glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. It gets switched around. doesn't really matter. He probably won't ask you about dimethyl allele. But you need to know, you might need to know, that isoprene is quickly converted over to dimethyl allele. But the premise is that two isoprenes are combined together to give you geronosyl. The Gerana seal, I think, in your books, Gerana seal, that might be a writing error. Not a big deal. Looks like a geriatric. If anything looks like a geriatric on your test, that's your 10 carbon intermediate. So, make two isoprenes, get a Gerana seal. I'm sorry, make two isoprenes, combine them together, get a Gerana seal. Then we go back to the beginning, we make another isoprene, we throw it on Gerana seal, and we get a Farna seal. It's a very repetitive process. So, go to isoprene. Go to isoprene, combine the isoprene, go to isoprene, combine the isoprene and the geronosyl, we have a farnesyl. Now, we go through that whole process again, three times, to get three isoprenes, to combine them together, to get another farnesyl, so that we can add farnesyl plus farnesyl. So, two important things that you're getting out of this. Acetyl-CoA is the source of all 27 carbons in cholesterol biosynthesis, because we just keep going back. And, since isoprene is the basic building block here that we're adding and we're adding and we're adding and cholesterols make steroid hormones and fat soluble vitamins isoprenes are the basic building block of steroid hormones and fat soluble vitamins I don't remember if that was nutrition or biochem where that was kind of brought up but isoprenes are the basic subunit of this thing the building block is acetyl-CoA the basic subunit is an isoprene so we go through this whole process we make the isoprenes, we get the geronosyl by combining them, we add another isoprene, we get a farnesyl, which is now 15 carbons. We go through that whole thing again to make another farnesyl, combine it together, and we get a squalene. Now, if you'll notice, this step requires a reductive 
donor, a reducing donor, so it requires another NADPH, and you lose the diphosphates. Not a huge deal for what you need to know for our purposes, but just structurally that's the, the technical thing. Now these reduction, reduction equi reducing equivalents are kind of important to see that it's between farnesyl and squalene. Now we've overshot our, any questions so far? Okay, we've overshot our number of carbons. We're at 30 carbons, which means eventually we need to decrease because how many carbons are in cholesterol? 27 carbons, good. So, we take our farnesyl, we turn it into a squalene, which is 30 carbons, and then right now, this is just a linear molecule. It's 30 carbons in a line, that's what we've made, which means that we need to make it cyclical because what's the basic ring structure, that phenothrene, phenothrene ring, is those two six carbon rings, the two five carbon rings, that's the cholesterol ring structure, which means that we need to take our linear squalene and make it cyclic linesterol. Cyclase, one of the enzymes you gotta know, what does cyclase do? Makes it cyclic, makes the basic ring structure of cholesterol. It's still 30 carbons, so what do we do for our last step? We decarboxylate three times and we get 27 carbon cholesterol. That's cholesterol biosynthesis. Now if you'll notice there's three enzymes you gotta know. You gotta know HMG-CoA synthase, HMG-CoA reductase, and cyclase. And what they do. HMG-CoA synthase does what? Makes HMG-CoA. HMG-CoA reductase takes HMG-CoA from HMG-CoA to mevalonate. And then cyclase takes it from squalene to linesterol, making it cyclic. And then the final step is ditch, just ditching three carbons so that we end up with 27 carbons, all of which came from acetyl-CoA, all of which are based off isoprene units. Now, this is an extra little addendum. We're going to talk about this. Well, I'll come back and talk about that in a minute. So, this pathway isn't tremendously... Well, I'll zoom in. The pathway isn't tremendously difficult except for learning all the dang substrate names. So, I don't remember the one that was around when I came through the mnemonic, but we kind of came up with another mnemonic. And you guys like mnemonics, right? So this is for all the guys in the room. Probably not. But back in the day, I know my mom liked to read romance novels. And I'm sure you guys all know what those are. And the ones that I saw laying around the house were the big, hairless, Native American man with the white woman, like, draped around his leg. You guys can all, you guys can all picture this, right? <laughs> you guys can all picture this. So, that's what this mnemonic is based off. So, starting where cholesterol biosynthesis starts, because remember that acetyl-CoA to acetyl-CoA through thiolase is not part of cholesterol biosynthesis. A hairless, manly, Indian, gently, foxes, some lusty chick. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently, the alternative that I came up with was a little crude for my classmates. So she said it should be foxes, or fondles, or fornicates, or anything more vulgar than that. So again, a hairless, manly Indian, gently, foxes, some lusty chick. A hairless, manly Indian, gently foxes some lusty chick. And that's the premise of a rom romance novel. The big hairless, manly Indian guy standing in the front and whatever he's going to do with the white woman that's already halfway down his body. <laughs> Justin, come on, you can relate, man. Tell me about it. <laughs> You've modeled for some of those, right? <laughs> he is not Indian. He's not Indian. Of course he's not Indian. <laughs> okay. Anyone have any problems with the mnemonic? Because there's another one about a uh, highly indigent German farmer indigent, which is, I think, local. A highly... A hairy midget indigent German farm smelly little children. So if you prefer that, you're welcome to that one, but I like mine. for the substrates of cholesterol biosynthesis. Now you notice it skips the second mevalonate step because again, it's not really important, but we're just di diphosphorylating it right here. And it skips dimethyl allele over here because we don't really care about dimethyl allele. It's just an intermediate step in the synthesis of geronseal. All right, 
So a hairless, manly Indian gently foxes some lusty chick. So that is cholesterol biosynthesis. You need to know three enzymes. You need to know the substrates. If you have that mnemonic, I don't think any of the letters overlap. So if you can write that mnemonic on your paper, you know the damn order. Okay? And you know that in that process, HMG-CoA synthase is the first enzyme between the first two, A, hairy, hair, hairless, sorry, they wouldn't be hairy. HMG-CoA to mavolinate is the second one. And then way down here, you just got to remember that squalene and linesterol have cyclase in between them. It's a biosynthetic reductive process. There's not a lot of talk about how many NADPHs go in because there's a ton of NADPHs because you need two NADPHs to make every isoprene. Oh, this is a good question, though. How many isoprene units does it take to make one cholesterol molecule? Six. Because there's five carbons in every isoprene, and we've got to get to 30 carbons. So it takes six isoprenes to make every cholesterol. How many acetyl-CoA does it take to make every cholesterol? 15. Because you've got to get to 30 carbons, which takes 15 two-carbon acetyl-CoA, and then back off to 27 carbons. So just in case you ask, it takes 15 acetyl-CoA, six isoprene subunits, and if it takes six isoprene subunits, how many NADPH does this process take? We've got to make isoprene six times, so it takes 12 NADPH up here and 2 at the bottom. 12 NADPH at the top, 2 at the bottom. So it would take 14 NADPH. Again, not, I don't think he tests on those numbers too much. Now, we talked about the rate-limiting enzyme. Over here, we've got the activators and inhibitors. What is our three-question rule for activation inhibition? What are the products and substrates? This is week three, you guys. Come on. Substrates activate, products inhibit. That's one of the questions. What are the other two questions? What hormone controls it? And what is the mechanism of action of that hormone? Know that. Please write that down and memorize that. It's going to save you a bunch of time on board. So, what hormone, act, what hormone controls it? And what is the mechanism of action of that hormone? Cholesterol is an anabolic process. What hormone controls anabolic processes? What hormone says we have excess? Let's build. Insulin. Insulin's mechanism of action is dephosphorylation. So two of the activators are insulin and dephosphorylation. Bam. You know those two right now. What's one of the substrates? What's the substrate? Acetyl-CoA. If you have a ton of acetyl-CoA, if you have insulin, if you have dephosphorylation, you're going to turn on cholesterol biosynthesis. You don't have to memorize them if you get that insulin is the anabolic hormone. Insulin's the builder. The only one you have to memorize off this list is that thyroid hormones activate cholesterol biosynthesis. Thyroid hormones activate cholesterol biosynthesis. What's the opposite? Who says, stop making stuff, we're out? Glucagon. What's glucagon do? Dephosphorylate. And what's the product of cholesterol biosynthesis? Cholesterol. So glucagon, phosphorylation, and cholesterol all turn it off. Glucagon says stop. It says stop by, de by phosphorylating. And its product is cholesterol. You don't have to memorize it. The only one you have to memorize is glucocorticoids turn off cholesterol biosynthesis. Glucocorticoids are stuff like cortisol. They're stress hormones. During times of stress, you don't synthesize much cholesterol, just so you make the connection. Now, at the very bottom here, you're going to notice another enzyme. Cholesterol ester right here. Sorry, I'm trying to get it to stay. Gosh dang it. Whatever. You guys can see it. We're taking cholesterol to cholesterol ester. Please note that this is not the final step in cholesterol biosynthesis. Cholesterol biosynthesis stops when we biosynthesize cholesterol. This is the next step. We're turning into cholesterol ester. What is cholesterol ester? The storage form. Know that, please. It's the storage form. What's the storage form of cholesterol? Cholesterol esters. Make sure you get the YL. I don't think he'll trick you on spelling, but just in case. Um, cholesterol ester is the storage form of cholesterol. And what's it esterified with? Why does it get the YL? Because it's going with a fatty acyl group, which means that we must need a fatty acyl group to come into this thing. And we're going from cholesterol, oh, it, it's attached to a CoA because that's how we're transporting it. It doesn't have to be, but in this case it is. That's the donor. It's activated. 
fatty acyl CoA. It's ditching its coash and it's getting esterified at what functional group on the cholesterol? The OH group. At what position is that OH? Third carbon, because that's the one place that's really good for esterification on a cholesterol. And what's the enzyme that does this? Acyl CoA cholesterol acyl transferase. Acyl CoA cholesterol acyl transferase, which is abbreviated, I didn't write that on there, ACAT, A C A T. You guys have probably heard ACAT. It's acyl CoA cholesterol acyl transferase, ACAT, which makes the storage form of cholesterol. So if he asks you, what enzyme is responsible for the production of the storage form of cholesterol? ACAT. Um, no. We're going to talk about LCAT. LCAT is, it makes the storage form, but in a very different location. So it, we'll talk about that in chapter two, or chapter four. Has he gotten through chapter four with you guys? No? Wow. He's moving. He's going to test you over it. Okay, so any questions on the synthesis of cholesterol esters, the storage form of cholesterol? Said it four times. You better know it. Okay. Uh, back to this. Page 32 is all of the same stuff. This is everything we just went through, all the steps. You can look through all the nice biochemical processes if you'd like. Here's your activated isoprene when it gets diphosphorylated at the bottom, but again, not a huge point for us. All the way down to the bottom of page number 33. And in fact, we're going to go a little farther than that. So the, does anyone know what the current drug therapy is to lower cholesterol? Statin drugs, which are terrible for you. Absolutely horrible. So they're looking at other pathways to stop cholesterol biosynthesis, probably something much farther down the line. Um, squalene monooxygenase, stuff like that. Basically, the, the one you really want to know that he might ask you about is that statins are used to inhibit cholesterol biosynthesis. There are other newer therapies that they're doing research on targeting different enzymes of the cholesterol biosynthetic pathway, but those are ones that you don't primarily need to know. So just understand that you can target pretty much any enzyme in cholesterol biosynthesis and shut it off, and it's going to stop. So on page number 34, the rate-limiting enzyme is HMG-CoA reductase. We've talked about it. Um, fasting decreases CoA reductase activity. What does that say? Fasting is glucagon. Glucagon phosphorylates, decreases HMG-CoA reductase, which is decreasing cholesterol biosynthesis. Cholesterol inhibits its own synthesis. Products inhibit. HMG-CoA reductase is inactivated. Here's your list right there. Make sure you know glucocorticoids. That's the one you have to know. And activated by dephosphorylation and insulin and acetyl-CoA and thyroid hormones. It, mm, so fasting causes glucagon. Glucagon is the we're out of stuff hormone. If we're out of stuff, we're not going to biosynthesize cholesterol. So glucagon and its mechanism of action, phosphorylation, and negative feedback by cholesterol all decrease HMG-CoA reductase, which is the rate-limiting enzyme of cholesterol biosynthesis. So he can say glucagon to you, or he can say fasting. Just be aware of that. If he says fasting, it means you're in a glucagon state. The only one you need to memorize that you don't know, and when I say that, it doesn't mean ignore the other three and say, Paul, you said that wouldn't be on the test. I just want you to understand that your mechanism gets you through that is glucocorticoids decrease cholesterol biosynthesis. That's basically cortisol. It's a stress hormone. It shuts off anabol an anabolism in a lot of tissues. Dephosphorylation means you're in a fed state, means you're under insulin control, and that's going to turn on cholesterol biosynthesis. And it's also activated by thyroid hormones. So for someone who has high cholesterol, should they eat a lot? Yeah, it's great. Lots of, lots of what? What would you want to do to increase your cholesterol? Eat a lot of? Hamburgers, hamburgers eggs, animal proteins, because those are heavy in cholesterol. So what's your dietary intake of cholesterol supposed to be every day? 300 milligrams. 300 milligrams. Make sure you know it's milligrams. What's your liver production of cholesterol every day? 1,000 milligrams. What's the normal blood level of cholesterol? 180 to 200 milligrams per deciliter. Good. Um, and cholesterol is used to biosynthesize what? What do we use cholesterol to make? 
It goes in phospholipid bilayers, as cholesterol is the little raft that it stuff attaches to. It goes towards steroid hormones, fat-soluble vitamins, and bile salts. We're going to talk about bile salts right now. Uh, or not quite right now, but here in a second. So, on page number 35, we've got some regular regulation control of this. I'm going to go down to the bottom. We're going to start at the bottom because that's the easiest one. So, number three on page number 35 in the HMG-CoA reductase regulation. We're talking about regulation of the rate-limiting enzyme of cholesterol biosynthesis. One of the ways we can regulate it is covalent modification. What does that mean? Phosphorylation, dephosphorylation. We covalently attach a group, the phosphor group, to HMG-CoA reductase, we can turn it on and off. Phosphorylation is what? Phosphorylation is glucagon. Glucagon turns it off. Dephosphorylation is insulin. Insulin turns it on. So covalent modification is one of the mechanisms of how we regulate HMG-CoA reductase. All it's saying is we're phosphorylating it, we're dephosphorylating it, we're turning it on and off. And who does that? Our hormones, insulin and glucagon. Trouble with that mechanism? Okay. Next one up. We can regulate HMG-CoA reductase by proteolytic degradation. So if we don't want to make cholesterol, we can break the thing that makes cholesterol. That's all that's saying. If we don't want to make cholesterol, we take the rate-limiting enzyme and we proteolytically degrade it, proteolytically cleave it. We destroy the rate-limiting enzyme of cholesterol biosynthesis. If we have no rate-limiting enzyme for cholesterol biosynthesis, we do not make cholesterol. So mechanism number two for our regulation of cholesterol biosynthesis is simply destroying the enzyme that makes cholesterol. And remember, the rate-limiting steps are those committed steps. Once you pass that, you make cholesterol. So if it can't go past that, it can't make cholesterol. This is the security department. Please be advised that the creek lot will close at 6 p.m. Please move your vehicle from the creek lot to the main campus at this time. Thank you. Now, this is kind of an interesting one. And I think this is on your sheet, so we'll go over that here in a minute. But just in general, we have transcriptional control of HMG-CoA reductase. What is HMG-CoA reductase? Rate limiting enzyme, what is, it, what's it, what is it as a macromolecule? Is it a fat? Is it a protein? Is it a carb? It's a protein. Why is it a protein? Because it's an enzyme. And like 95% of our enzymes are protein. So it's a protein. And how do we make proteins? We transcribe them. So if we want, <laughs> or that. So if we want to control the rate limiting enzyme of cholesterol biosynthesis, we can simply turn on and off the making of the protein. We can degrade the ones we have. We can activate and deactivate the ones we have. Or we can just stop making more or make more. If we want more cholesterol, we make more HMG-CoA reductase. If we want less cholesterol, we make less HMG-CoA reductase. That's all this is saying. Transcriptional control. Now, SREBP stands for sterile regulatory element binding protein. Sterile regulatory element binding protein. Please know it as SREBP. When SREBP is bound to the mRNA, it causes the transcri transcription of HMG-CoA reductase. When SREBP is bound to the mRNA, it causes the transcription of HMG-CoA reductase. And remember, transcription is what? DNA to mRNA or mRNA to protein? DNA to mRNA. Translation is mRNA to protein. So, I may have said that wrong. That's why you probably missed it. When SREPP is bound to the DNA, it causes the transcription of the mRNA for, S for uh, HMG CoA reductase. Not an important point. Not going to test you over the semantics like that. But when SREPP is there, it makes HMG-CoA reductase. If we make HMG-CoA reductase, what happens to cholesterol levels? They go up. Now, there's another one called SCAP, which is SREBP cleavage activating protein, which binds to SREBP and stops it from working. If SCAP is attached to SREBP, it stops SREBP from working, what happens to cholesterol levels? They go down because we stop transcribing the mRNA for HMG-CoA reductase, which means we don't have mRNA, we don't have translation, we don't make the rate-limiting enzyme. So, in short, if you look on this little sheet that I gave you, 
on the left. Transcriptional control, SREBP, sterile regulatory element binding protein, causes transcription of mRNA for HMG coA reductase. You can write in there if you want, increases cholesterol. It upregulates it. SCAP, SREBP cleavage activating protein, turns off SREBP, stops SREBP. If it stops SREBP, it decreases cholesterol. HMG-CoA can also be proteolytically cleaved or phosphorylated, dephosphorylated, which we talked about. So that is your transcriptional control of HMG-CoA. All right. Now, last thing in this chapter. Any questions on that? Okay. I forgot about this. Here's your, on page number 36, partway down, statins are competitive inhibitors of HMG-CoA reductase. Statins are competitive inhibitors of HMG-CoA reductase. They act directly on the rate-limiting enzyme of cholesterol biosynthesis. So what effect do statins have on cholesterol biosynthesis? They lower cholesterol biosynthesis. That's the primary drug that's out on the market right now. Um, yada, 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 used to treat hypercholesterolemia, which is high cholesterol in the blood. So that's what you use for that. Um, other non-statin agents they're looking at are targeting squalene, farnesyl, linesterol, et cetera, et cetera. So they're looking at non-statin agents which don't target the rate-limiting enzyme, they just target other enzymes of, of cholesterol biosynthesis. That's for your information, doesn't usually show up on, on stuff you need to know for boards or, or Dr. Starkar. Atherosclerosis, have you guys looked at this in any classes yet? This is placking of arterial walls. This is deposition of cholesterol and cholesterol esters in the blood vessel. Deposition of cholesterol and cholesterol esters in the arterial wall. We're going to talk about it next chapter. Um, I'll make sure you guys know it, but it comes up here. You can highlight it now. We'll talk about it in chapter four as well. It's more important there. Now, lastly, we're going to talk about bile salts or bile, bile acids, bile salts, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they are amphipathic molecules. What does that mean? Amphipathic. Hydrophobic, hydrophilic, they do not go both ways. <laughs> hydrophobic and hydrophilic. They're both hydrophobic and hydrophilic, which gives them a very important thing we're going to talk about. Now, please, please, please note this. They are produced by the liver, stored in the gallbladder, secreted in the bile into the small intestine. They are produced by the liver, stored in the gallbladder, and secreted into the bile. Please know that. They're not produced in the gallbladder. They're not secreted in the liver, they're produced in the liver, stored in the gallbladder, secreted into the small intestine as bile, or with the bile, as bile. They're important during a meal. They provide a very important function when we're digesting fats. They emulsify fats, which basically takes fat particles and breaks them into a bunch of, or, or isolates them into a bunch of little bubbles that our enzymes can work on. Remember, fats aren't soluble. Our enzymes are primarily proteins, which are soluble molecules. So if we want to be able to digest fats, which usually clump together in these big balls, as you've, if you've ever dumped oil in water, you know that, it clumps together. So these bile salts go into that oil and spread it apart and isolate it so that our enzymes can get in there and attack it. It makes micelles, which are little bubbles of fat that our enzymes can work on. This process is called emulsification. Bile salts are, are responsible for emulsification which is just taking the fat that you're ingesting and spreading it out so our enzymes have a chance to access it. So they're important for the digestion of dietary fats. Important for the digestion of dietary fats. Um, they solubilize dietary lipids by spreading them out so our enzymes can work on them because they need to be soluble by producing micelles. And then we can use lipases for their breakdown. So they just make the, they break up the, the fat. They don't break the fat, but they spread it apart into little bubbles. They solubilize it that our enzymes can get a handle on it. Micelle-containing bile acids also take up lipid-soluble vitamins. So if you have cruddy fat di digestion, you don't absorb fat-soluble vitamins. Big problem in people who have, let's say, gallbladder removed or something like that. This is also why they don't always, I found out, but they should recommend if you have your gallbladder removed, you cannot eat high-fat meals because the gallbladder is the storage for bile. When you eat a big fat meal, when you go across the street to Burger King and you get your milkshake and all that, your gallbladder squeezes 
and secretes a bunch of bile salts and bile acids into your small intestine, spreads out the fat so you can digest it. If you don't have a gallbladder, you can't do that. You can't handle high-fat meals. It just goes right through you. Um, is also why when people eat high-fat meals, if they have inflammation in the gallbladder, they get tremendous pain right here. Because if they eat a high-fat meal, it triggers the gallbladder to contract, or if they have gallstones or something, that's when you get the pain. It's triggered by fat and acid in your small intestine. You'll talk about that in physio if you already have it. So they're responsible for the emulsification of fat, spreading it out and solubilizing it so our enzymes can get to work on it. Produced in the liver, stored in the gallbladder, secreted as the bile in the, into the small intestine. We have two primary bile salts. You need to know their names. Cholate and kinocholate, or cholate and kinocholate if that's the hood you're from. Um, cholate and kinocholate are your primary bile salts. You can look at the structure right here. It's a cholesterol base right here, the phenothrene ring. And then we have a trial attached to it. Um, I don't think that's really important for him, but I just noted that, that there's it's got three hydroxyl groups on it. It's got the normal one of cholesterol at position three, and it's got one at seven and 12, and this one has one at seven. So cholate and kinocholate are your primary bile salts. Cholate and kinocholate are synthesized by the rate-limiting enzyme 7-alpha-hydroxylase. The rate-limiting enzyme for bile salt production, bile acid production, is 7-alpha-hydroxylase. What do you think 7-alpha-hydroxylase does? It hydroxylates cholesterol at position 7. It adds a hydroxyl at position 7. That's how we make our primary bile salts, 7-alpha hydroxylase. So just think about your cholesterol. It's only got the hydroxyl group at position 3, which is the only place it can esterify fats to make cholesterol esters. This 7-alpha hydroxylase gives it another, um, another group to attach to at, seven, at the 7th position. It hydroxylates at the 7th position. It makes 7-hydroxycholesterol, not a big deal. In case 7-hydroxycholesterol here is kinocholic acid. Secondary bile salts are deoxycholic and deoxykinocholic acid, where we rip the hydroxyl group back off position 7. We've deoxied it. So primary bile salts, cholic acid, kinocholic acid. Secondary bile salts, deoxycholic acid, deoxykinocholic acid what you need to know from there. And then lastly, we can conjugate our bile salts. What is conjugation? Combining stuff, there's a specific definition we're going to talk about on the next page. We conjugate our bile salts with amino acids, taurine or glycine. You have cholic acid, you have kinocholic acid. If you add taurine or glycine, you get taurocholic acid or glycocholic acid or taurokinocholic acid or tor glycokinocholic acid. You just add a uh, amino acid to it. Taurine is an amino acid. It's not one of the 21 amino acids that humans use in their proteins, but it is an amino acid, and it's in what? What's taurine in? Red Bull. Energy drinks. So we have three classes of, of bile salts that you need to know. Primary, cholic and kinocholic. Secondary, deoxykinocholic and deoxycholic, and conjugated, which is when they add the amino acid to them. Now, this is important. On page number 38, conjugation of bile salts with taurine and glycine, or the conjugation of bile salts, lowers the pKa value, makes them more acidic, more soluble, and more absorbable. Conjugation makes them more acidic, more soluble, more absorbable, lowers the pKa. Please know that. Conjugation makes them more acidic, more soluble, more absorbable, and lowers the pKa. Because it's adding these groups to it. It's adding amino acids. Amino acids are generally hydrophilic molecules. If you add a hydrophilic portion to a hydrophobic thing, it's probably going to get more soluble. You're adding a hydrophilic portion to it. So, and amino acids, like I said, generally are. Clinical correlate. Cholesterol gallstones can be formed from cholesterol. Uh, keno deoxycholate or, yeah, don't worry about that. We're going to talk about LCAT in the next chapter, so don't worry about it here. And at the very bottom, you can take cholesterol to pregnenolone to progesterone, and then it goes to all your different hormones. Again, not a real important pathway. He's not going to test you over that, but it is important to realize, he's not going to test you over the specifics of that, but it is important to realize that all of your 
steroid hormones come from cholesterol bases, which means they're built off isoprene units. And if you care for future reference, pregnolone is the common intermediate between cholesterol and all your steroid hormones. It's the pathway that everything goes through. So if you look on your little sheet right here, all steroid hormones come from cholesterol, or and cholesterol comes from isoprene units, therefore isoprene units make all steroid hormones. Bile salts produced in the liver, stored in the bile, I'm sorry, produced in the liver, secreted in the bile, stored in the gallbladder. Not in that order. Primary bile salts, cholic and kinocholic. Here's your rate-limiting enzyme for their production, 7-alpha-hydroxylase. Secondary is deoxycholic and deoxykinocholic, produced by the removal of a hydroxyl group at position 7, deoxyd. Conjugated bile salts, addition of amino acids. So you can make torocholic or glycocholic. They make them more soluble, more acidic, and more absorbable. There's your little shortcut on there. In the very bottom, we talked about all this. Cholesterol is the precursor to bile acids, steroids, and fat-soluble vitamins. Dietarily, 300 milligrams. Liver, 1,000 milligrams. Normal blood levels, 180 to 200 per deciliter. Biosynthesis occurs in the cytosol. Everything comes from acetyl-CoA. And the reducing equivalent for all biosynthetic reductive reactions is NADPH, which comes from the PPP, or the malic enzyme reaction. Cool with this chapter? All right. You guys are glazed, I know. It's awesome. Uh, do you want five minutes before I roll through the next one? Okay. Take five, then we're going to go to chapter four. They will be drawing. You'll have to stay awake.
Okay, so the good news is, well, the bad news is we're going to get started. I know you guys don't want to, I'm sorry. The good news is we're going to go through this chapter like four times. It's going to get a little ridiculous because I'm going to take you through it once, and then I'm going to take you through it again, and I'm going to add some detail, and then I'm going to take you through it again, and I'm going to add some detail. Your alarm went off, by the way. I snoozed it. Um, so we're going to keep going back through it, and each time we go through it, we're going to add a little bit of detail to it. So the first time is going to be a very light graze through it once we get through this basic stuff at the beginning of the chapter. Now, these are those two sections I told you in Chapter 3 and Chapter 2, or Chapter 1, whatever it was, where I said skip it. This is a basic version of what we're going through in Chapter 4, and since it's all in the first test, now is when we're going to co cover it. So this is everything we've been skipping so far. So the biomedical importance of lipoproteins. First of all, what is a lipoprotein? Fat and protein. Fantastic. Great answer. It's fat and protein put together. We use them as a carrier, transporter, mobilizer of lipids. Why do we need a carrier for lipids? Because they're not soluble. So we have to have a protein that is specifically built to carry fats. That's what our lipoproteins do. They're proteins that are built to carry fats throughout the body. So we use them for cholesterol, cholesterol esters, triacylglycerols, any other lipid component. Anything that's non-soluble lipid, we use lipoproteins to carry around. Now, one way we can carry these things, I believe, and I don't think I'm misspeaking, is albumin. Albumin is your basic blood carrier protein. But since we have to transport so many lipids, we have specialized lipid carriers. Those lipid carriers are called lipoproteins. That's what we're talking about this chapter. Um, we use them to store energy in the form of lipids in the liver, the intestines, and the adipose tissue. Because we eat fat, we make fat, and we have to get fat out to our adipose tissue. Fat doesn't go through the bloodstream, so we take it there with lipoproteins. They drop it off, and we store fat in adipose tissue, much to your guys' dismay and mine. Um, we store fat in adipose tissue. We store fat in the liver for times of, glucon or times of, of fasting where we're under, in a glucagonic state. And to utilize lipids by oxidation within the muscle tissue. So if we want to break down any lipids in the muscle tissues, we ship them out there. Um, so, down here at the bottom, abnormalities in lipoprotein synthesis can give you hypertriacylglycerolemia very easily. High triacylglycerols in the blood hyperlipidemia, hypercholesterolemia, high cholesterol in the blood, atherosclerosis, and of course, obesity. So again, it can cause too much cholesterol in the blood, too much triglycerides in the blood, because that's what it carries. It can cause atherosclerosis, which I'll go through the mechanism with you guys later. And it can cause obesity, because what does it do? It stores it in adipose tissue. If you make too much fat, if you store too much fat, you get fat. That's all it's saying. So what is a lipoprotein? It's a lipid and an apoprotein. Do you guys remember apoenzymes? My favorite part of try one. Me apo. You holo me. That's the same thing. It's an apoprotein with a lipid attached to it. So the apoprotein is the protein, proteinaceous component of the lipoprotein. It's an apoprotein because it's an incomplete thing. It needs its partner. It needs its friend. It needs the cofactor that goes with it. In this case, it's a lipid. Once the apoprotein picks up a lipid, it is now a lipoprotein. Before that, it's an apoprotein. So the apoprotein is the protein moiety of the lipoprotein. So the apoprotein is the proteinaceous part of it. Make sure you know that, just in case. It consists of a core of hydrophobic lipids surrounded by a shell of polar lipids and the protein. This is the basis of hydrophobi hydrophobicity, hydrophilicity, is that if you have stuff that's hydrophobic, it tucks in on itself. If you have stuff that's, I say that, hydrophobic tucks in on itself. If you have stuff that's hydrophilic, it goes to the outside. So on these guys, we've got a protein part. Proteins are primarily phobic or philic. Proteins are primarily hydrophilic. So the protein stays on the outside. Stuff like phospholipids. Phospholipids are lipids. They need to be transported. Their phosphate head goes out. Their tails go in. Um, glycolipids. Their gly glucose part goes out. Their tail goes in. And then stuff like cholesterol and triglycerides and all that stuff that's non-polar, that's hydrophobic, all gets tucked in the middle. So the polar stuff sticks out, the non-polar stuff, the hydrophobic stuff stays in the middle. Basics of phobic and philic folding. folding. Wow. Um, we're going to talk about the apoproteins. The principal apoproteins are right here. If you'll notice, there's a nice little sheet that you hopefully have in front of you. If you don't, come up and talk to me anytime. This sheet is all your apoproteins. This is what you're going to draw on for the rest of the chapter. These apoproteins are the list that you need to know of all the different apoproteins and what they do, and we're going to go through the whole thing. 
We're not going to go through the apoproteins on our first pass through, though. We're going to go through the apoproteins on our second pass, I think. So, core of hydrophobic lipids surrounded by a shell of polar lipids and the apoproteins, and the apoproteins are on that list in front of you. We're going to talk about them all. So, right here, middle of page 40. Two main roles of lipoproteins. Two main roles of lipoproteins. I would know the two main roles of lipoproteins. To solubilize highly hydrophobic lipids so that we can transport them. We are making them more soluble by carrying them, tucking them into a core so that we can get them through the bloodstream. And they contain signals that contain movement of particular lipids in and out of specific tissues. In other words, they say when you're going to drop off fat and when you're going to pick up fat or lipids. When I, when I say fat, I just mean lipids. It can be cholesterol, it can be a phospholipid, it can be anything like that. They contain signals, which we're going to talk about, that say drop off fat or pick up fat at the tissues. So, cholesterol, triacylglycerols, and other lipids carried in body fluids by lipoproteins. We know this. Now, this chart, you need to know the basics of, but we're going to go over it. Hmm? Yep. So, What's more dense, fat or protein? Protein. So, does the bodybuilder or the poster child for, what are the, Debbie, Debbie snack cakes float in a pool? Which one floats in a pool? Debbie, Debbie snack cakes. So, that means that fat is less dense than protein. Protein is primarily water, especially when we talk about like a bodybuilder or something. But what you need to know is that fat is less dense than protein, and fat floats. Very easy way to remember that is fat floats, so fat is the less dense component. So when we talk about these guys, you need to know the order of their density. The order of their density is inversely proportional to their protein and fat content, right? Or inversely proportional to their fat content. So the person with the highest fat and the lowest protein is very dense or not very dense. The person with the highest, pro or highest fat and least protein is not very dense compared to the guy with the most protein and the least fat. The most protein and the least fat is very dense, right? So we've got two outliers, well, one outlier in this chart. We've got chylomicrons whose name doesn't make sense. Chylomicrons are the least dense lipoproteins. They are the least dense hypo lipoproteins. If they're the least dense, they have the most fat or the least fat? If they're the least dense, they have the most fat. Now the rest of these guys, their names make sense. Very low density lipoprotein. Very low density lipoprotein. Do you think he has high density or low density? Pretty low, right? Which means he's got what percentage of fat? High percentage of fat. Then we have intermediate density lipoproteins. He is more dense than very low-density lipoprotein, but less dense than low-density lipoprotein. Their names tell you what they are. Very low-density lipoprotein, intermediate-density lipoprotein, low-density lipoprotein, and high-density lipoprotein. High-density lipoprotein has the highest density. It has the most fat or the least fat. It has the least fat because it's the most dense. It has the most protein or the least protein. Most protein. You guys got it. Please make sure you know that. The big ones are your outliers here because they're at the edge of the scale. They're the ones that are usually going to get asked. Which one is the least dense? Which one is the most dense? Which one has the most protein? Which one has the most fat? Which one has the least fat? Which one has the least protein, et cetera, et cetera? So make sure you know the general trend. You don't need to know the numbers. You don't need to know what percentage they are. You just need to know the order. You need to know that chylomicrons are the least dense, then very low density, then intermediate, then low, then high. And you need to know that in the inverse relationship, that's the way the protein content goes, is least protein, more, 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 most protein. Because protein goes with density. The more protein you have compared to your fat, the more dense you are. The less protein you have or the more fat you have, the less dense you are. Now, we also need to talk about something real quick. I wrote this chart over here. You don't need to know the percentages, but you need to know these kind of trends. You need to know that chylomicrons are the primary carrier of triacylglycerols, or triglycerides, et cetera, et cetera. The primary component of a chylomicron is a triglyceride. 
they carry your TGs. So the lipoprotein that has the highest triglycerides is chylomicrons. You need to know that the highest concentration of cholesterol is LDL. The highest concentration of cholesterol is LDL. In fact, LDL and HDL primarily carry cholesterol. You can write that down. Both LDL and HDL carry cholesterol. Whereas chylomicrons carry TGs. We'll deal with that when we get there, but not a big deal right now. Just know it. LDL, HDL, cholesterol, chylomicrons, TGs. So, here's a nice little picture. You've got your core of hydrophobic lipids and your shell of hydrophilic lipids. So in here, you've got nonpolar lipids, you've got cholesterol esters, you've even got a cholesterol. What's this little group sticking out here in the edge? Here's cholesterol. What's right there? The OH group at position three, because it's the only polar part of cholesterol. And then you've got amphipathic lipids. It's showing phospholipids. Oh, here's some phospholipids. You've got your apoproteins out here. You've got apoproteins there. So the hydrophilic stuff stays on the outside. The hydrophobic stuff goes to the middle, just like everything else. So we're going to skip this. We'll come back to all this. Um, you can draw wherever you want. There's blank space at the bottom of your little sheet here. So if you want to draw there, you're welcome to. So we're going to start. And my drawing is terrible. Please be warned. Um, we have we have a little digestive system, so we got some stomach. Goes through some duodenum, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and comes down to this windy little bit called the small intestines, which is primarily where absorption happens, right? Whoops. So we've got a digestive system there. I'll just write GI, so you guys are aware that that's not a scribble. So you've got your GI system right there. Right next to that GI system, we have blood circulation, or in some cases, lymph circulation, which isn't a big deal, but we'll talk about that later. Um, you have some sort of circulation that goes from the outside of your body, the GI tract, to the inside of your body, lymph or blood, and lymph ends up back at blood anyways. What we have in the blood is we have some TGs, and we have some cholesterol, and we have some phospholipids, Etc. 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 We have dietary fats. Dietary fats. Any dietary lipid comes from the diet, comes from the GI tract. Those dietary fats are absorbed across the wall after they are emulsified by bile salts, after they are broken down by lipases. Once they're small enough to get in, they're absorbed across the wall and they go into the bloodstream. They are picked up specifically by a chylomicron. And if you hear dietary fat, you damn well better answer chylomicron. If you hear dietary fat, answer chylomicron. Because chylomicrons are responsible for absorption of all dietary fat. And what is primarily the main dietary fat we take in? Triglycerides. Which is why chylomicrons have the highest triglyceride content. Because they pick up dietary fats and the majority of the dietary fats we eat are triacylglycerols, triglycerides, TGs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Chylomicrons are responsible for the transport, the collection and transport of dietary fat. Have I made myself clear? Okay. Now this blood vessel takes us all the way back to the liver, which is on the wrong side of the stomach. I know. Don't criticize me. It's a posterior view. Thank you. Takes us back to the liver. The chylomicrons have picked up some TGs, they've picked up some cholesterol, they've picked up some whatever, they've picked up some more TGs. So they're loaded with fats now. As they pick up triglycerides from the digestive tract, do they become more or less dense? As they pick up triglycerides from the digestive tract, do chylomicrons become more or less dense? Less dense. The more fat they have, the less dense they are. Make sure you guys know this. I'm going I'm to quiz you on this all night long until you all get it right. If you're getting it wrong, start thinking about it. If you're still getting it wrong at the end of the night, come up and talk to me. That's an important concept for test questions in this chapter, is which one is more dense, which one is less dense, what happens as they change. By the way, who brought me this paperwork? CJ's Small Breakthrough Business. Oh, shoot. I picked it up from the office. I was wondering about that. 
like, why is someone giving me random stuff without telling me what it is? Okay, thank you. So, uh, what's the phospholipid. Oh. I ran out of room. Mostly triacylglycerols, though, because chylomicrons carry dietary fats, primarily triacylglycerols. Phospholipid. God, you guys are terrible. We're going we're gonna to get really close so you all blind people can see this. So we roll back to the liver. Let me zoom up to the liver because we don't have room on here. We roll back to the liver where chylomicrons are reabsorbed by the liver. Now along the way, chylomicrons may drop off triglycerides to the peripheral tissue. Along the way to the liver, chylomicrons may drop off triglycerides to the peripheral tissue. They're delivering fat to tissue. That is the purpose of lipoprotein, is to deliver fat to tissue. When a chylomicron drops off triglycerides, it goes from being a chylomicron to a chylomicron remnant. A remnant is what's left, right? And that's all it's saying. It's a remnant of its former self. It's given up some of its fat. When a chylomicron drops off triglycerides, does it get more or less dense? It gets more dense. It has a higher protein content. It has a lower fat content. You're going to see this throughout all of them. We have chylomicron remnants, and we have remnants of all the other guys. All it's saying is it's dropped off some of its stuff. It's a remnant of its former self. Anyone have a problem with that terminology? So chylomicron remnant is after it's loaded at the, at the small intestines. It runs to the liver. It drops off some stuff on the way. It becomes a chylomicron remnant and then it is absorbed by the liver. In the liver, it is broken down. Its fats are processed by the liver, which we're going to talk about next. The chylomicron is rebuilt, recycled, and it is shipped back out to do its job again. I think chylomicrons are also synthesized in the small intestines a little bit or something. But liver does primarily the synthesis of these guys. Chylomicrons are responsible for Absorption of what fat? Dietary fat. Okay. Now, from the liver, we have this nice blood circulation over here. The liver makes VLDL. What does VLDL stand for? Very low density lipoprotein. Does VLDL, is VLDL more dense or less dense than a chylomicron? More dense. Good more dense than a chylomicron. The liver makes VLDL, and when it makes it, it takes all those fats that the chylomicron dropped off, and it loads up on them. It picks up cholesterol, it picks up phospholipids, it picks up TGs. So the chylomicron comes in, is broken down by the liver, it's rebuilt and shipped out as an empty chylomicron, and all the fats that it dropped off, the liver ships out to the rest of the body as a, T uh, as a VLDL, attached to a VLDL. So, chylomicrons go from intestines to liver, intestines to liver, intestines to liver. VLDL takes care of the rest of the body. VLDL takes care of the rest of the body. Chylomicrons are responsible for dietary fat and nothing else. They can drop off stuff on the way, but it's on the way to the liver. Because what's the major blood system that takes stuff from the GI to the liver? Portal system. Portal system gives liver first dibs on all dietary stuff. You guys gotten there yet? I feel like you talked about that. Cells and tissues or G. Okay. So the liver makes VLDL and ships out VLDL loaded with cholesterol and TGs and all that stuff. This VLDL rolls out into the tissue and he gets out here. And what does he do? He delivers fat to tissue. So he takes some of his TGs and he throws them out to the peripheral tissue. When he drops off triglycerides, does he get more dense or less dense? He gets more dense as he drops off fats. Now, once that VLDL drops off fats, he is known as a VLDL remnant, a.k.a. IDL. You can call him a VLDL remnant, or you can call him IDL. He got more dense. He went from very low density to intermediate density. So, this guy is now known as IDL, or a VLDL remnant. Because he is a remnant of what he was as VLDL, and he is also intermediate density. 
He go, went up in density. He has more protein. He has less fat. You guys following? No? Okay, we'll go. Oh, okay. No. So the liver ships out VLDL loaded with fats. He gets out to the tissue, and the tissue's like, hey, we want some fat. So he drops off some fat at the tissue. When he drops off fat, he gets more dense. The less fat he has, the more, the more protein he has, percentage-wise. When he gets more dense, he goes from very low density to intermediate density. He is upgraded in density from low density to middle density. So he gets more dense. He is known as intermediate density lipoprotein or a remnant of VLDL because VLDL has given up some of its stuff. It's no longer VLDL. It's now a VLDL remnant. Okay. Now, If you're more fat, you're less dense. Yep, you got it. So, now there are two options. One of the options is this IDL is reabsorbed by the liver, broken down, recycled, its fats are shipped back out as VLDL. Cool? No big deal. The VLDL remnant or the IDL can be reabsorbed by the liver, broken down, recycled as VLDL, because remember, IDL is the exact same thing as VLDL. It just has less fat. So if we break down an IDL, we've got the building blocks for a VLDL. If we break down an IDL, we've got the building blocks for a VLDL, because the only difference between IDL and VLDL is the fat content. Fat goes back to the liver. It's resynthesized as VLDL. It gets reshipped out as VLDL. It becomes IDL again, and the process continues. The other, other option is this guy does not go back to the liver. He is not reabsorbed and broken down. He continues on his merry little way. And along the way, he drops off TGs and cholesterol and whatever the hell else he's dropping off, primarily TGs. And he becomes, oh, as he's dropping stuff off, does he become more dense? As he's dropping fats off, does he become more dense or less dense? He becomes more dense. So he goes from IDL to LDL. He goes from intermediate density to low density. He is increasing in density. The whole time, these guys are increasing in density as they drop fats off. IDL, I'm sorry, LDL, is also known as VLDL remnant because it's still a remnant of VLDL. You could call it an IDL remnant, although nobody does, or it's just known as LDL. So LDL is known as LDL or possibly VLDL remnant because it's still a remnant of VLDL. It still has the same proteins as VLDL. The only difference is how much fat it has. And then last step, LDL is reabsorbed by the liver. Broken down, fats are recycled, LDL is recycled, rebuilt as VLDL, shipped out, loaded with fat, and the process continues. That's our first pass. We're not going to deal with HDL yet. We'll bring that guy in later. Questions on this? We're going to go through this like two more times. It's going to get easier and easier. It's, it's getting recycled by the liver. Right here or here? TGs, cholesterol, TGs, CHO, cholesterol. So, basic process, no big deal. Questions before we roll through it again? We're going to repeat a lot of that stuff. It does pick up stuff. We'll talk about that when we talk about HDL. Don't worry about it right now. So, now we need to go over the apoproteins, particularly the ones we're going to look at first are B48, B100, C2, and E. Don't worry about the rest right now. B48, B100, C2, and E. These are the first four I want to teach you guys. And don't worry about the right two columns. We're just dealing with what's on the screen right now. That's all you need to know for this first, second pass through. We have four apoproteins that we're going to need to know, and I wrote down what molecules they're in, and you need to know what ones they're in, but you're going to understand that by the time we're done. We're going to start with ApoB100. ApoB100 is an apoprotein. It's hydrophilic. It goes on the outside of the molecules, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. ApoB100 is responsible for the assembly and secretion of fats and the detection of LDL receptors, which means that these lipoproteins have a protein. One of their protein parts is responsible for the assembly and the secretion of fats, which is important because they pick up and they drop off fat. They pick up fat primarily at the liver, and they drop off fat at other tissues. The assembly and the secretion of fats and the detection of LDL receptors on the liver. 
LDL receptors are named for the LDL molecule or VLDL remnants. The liver has them to pick up these guys when they're done. So when these guys bump back into the liver, ApoB100 detects the receptor so these guys can be picked up again, broken down, recycled, shipped out. That's what ApoB100 is. ApoB48 is a 48 amino acid protein. This is a 100 amino acid protein. ApoB48 does the exact same thing as ApoB100. It's just a smaller version of it because it goes in a chylomicron. And a chylomicron is responsible for less stuff. Chylomicron does what? Picks up dietary fats, takes them to the liver. It's the same thing. Assembly and secretion of fats, detection of LDL receptors, because anything that has ApoB48 and B100, we can pick up at the liver, break down, recycle, ship back out. ApoB100 is in all of your lipoproteins except chylomicrons because chylomicrons have ApoB48. Sorry, I said it. B100 is in everything except chylomicrons because B48 is in chylomicrons. Do the same thing. Assemble, secrete fats. And assembly is much more important for chylomicrons because they pick up a lot of fat. They have to put this stuff together to carry it and then roll to the liver, get reabsorbed, get broken down, get recycled. ApoC2 activates lipoprotein lipase. Lipoprotein lipase cleaves fats off your lipoprotein. It cleaves fats off your lipoprotein. It's known as LPL. Now notice, and I'm going to make this clear a couple of times, these lipoproteins do not carry lipoprotein lipase. Lipoprotein lipase is present in the tissues at the target, or in the cell walls at the target tissues. The thing that cleaves the fat off the lipoproteins, the enzyme that does it, the lipase, is present in the walls at the target tissue. But they do have an apoprotein that activates the enzyme that's present at the tissues that cleaves the fats off. Their lipoprotein activates the enzyme that is present at the tissues, that enzyme is lipoprotein lipase, that cleaves the fats off these guys and drops them at the tissues. They do not carry lipoprotein lipase. They carry an activator for lipoprotein lipase. And we're going to go through all this stuff again. We're just giving you the definitions. And APOE is the ligand for binding to the LDL receptor, which means that when they get to the liver and they detect the LDL receptor. ApoE flips around and sticks itself into the LDL receptor on the liver and allows attachment so these guys can be endocytosed into the liver. So we have something that detects the receptor and something that binds to the receptor. Does that make sense? A ligand binds to a receptor. So we have something that detects the receptor at the liver, something that binds to the receptor so we can endocytose it, and ApoC2 is responsible for activating the thing that cleaves the fats off. Now let's go through this a couple times. So our chylomicrons right here, they pick up fats at the small intestine. What apoprotein allows them to assemble fats? ApoB48, because remember, they have B48. They pick up fats with ApoB48. They assemble their fats. They roll onto the liver. They get out to here to these target tissues, and they're like, hey, these target tissues want some fat. So they use ApoC2 to activate LPL. So out here, the chylomicron uses ApoC2 to activate LPL, which is out here in the tissues, LPL in the tissues, when they activate LPL, LPL cleaves lipo fats off the lipoprotein. It is a lipoprotein lipase. It cleaves the fat off a lipoprotein. So their apoprotein activates an enzyme present in the tissues at the target tissue that cleaves fats off the chylomicron, allowing the chylomicron to drop off TGs. Does that make sense? Okay. Then they roll up here, they get back to the liver. On the liver, there is an LDL receptor right here an LDL receptor. ApoB48 detects the LDL receptor, and then ApoE binds to that LDL receptor. ApoE is the ligand for the receptor. It's the thing that will bind to the receptor. ApoE binds to that receptor, and I want you to write this. It is endocytosed by a very specific process. It is endocytosed by receptor 
mediated endocytosis. Receptor mediated endocytosis is the process by which that receptor takes stuff into the liver, which makes sense. It's being endocytosed. Well, it's attached to a receptor. It's receptor mediated endocytosis, TQ, TQ, TQ. Receptor mediated endocytosis at the liver. Any questions on that? Is that a big deal? <laughs> no. Uh, ApoE binds to the receptor, and the process by which these guys are taken into the liver is called receptor mediated endocytosis. Any questions on that process so far? The apoproteins is what they do, because we're going to keep going through it. Okay. We make VLDL. VLDL rolls out here into the tissues. It wants to secrete a fat. What allows for the secretion of fat? What allows for assembly and secretion of fat? ApoB100. So they have ApoB100, which allows them to assemble fats back here in the liver and allows them to secrete fats out here. But primarily, lipoprotein lipase is present at the target tissue. What apoprotein does VLDL have that activates LPL? APOC2. So they get out to the tissue. They're like, hey, this fool wants some fat. Joke's on him. I don't want it. It cues APOC2. APOC2 activates lipoprotein lipase that's present at the target tissue causing lipoprotein lipase to cleave fats off VLDL, making it more dense or less dense, making it more dense as it loses fats. When it loses fats, it becomes IDL or VLDL remnants. And then IDL gets out there and it's like, hey, this fool wants some more fat. It activates APOC2. APOC2 activates lipoprotein lipase present at the tissues. Lipoprotein lipase cleaves fats off lipoproteins, causing the dropping off of TGs, uh, cholesterols, and TGs, and whatever else, of lipids. VL, or I'm sorry, IDL or VLDL remnants gets more dense as it drops off fat. It becomes LDL, or another VLDL remnant, or an IDL remnant, if you're so inclined. And either of those guys, at any point, roll back to the liver. They detect the receptors at the liver with ApoB100, because ApoB100 detects LDL receptors, and these are LDL receptors at the liver. Even if they don't pick up LDL all the time, they pick up IDL, they pick up chylomicrons, they're still called LDL receptors. ApoB100 detects those receptors, and ApoE binds to them. ApoE is the ligand for binding to LDL receptors. And then they are endocytosed by receptor-mediated endocytosis. They are recycled, they are broken down, they are reassembled, and they are shipped back out as VLDLs. <laughs> Good thing is it's vodcasted. You can go back and draw it as many times as you want. There's no easy way to draw this. Are we is this starting to click? Are we starting to get a little flow to this, yeah? Okay, good. So, what do we want to talk about next? Okay, so this is the basic process. We've gone through this one. We've gone through this twice. We're going to go through this again. Now we're going to look at APOC3 and APOC1. APOC3 and APOC1. APOC1 inhibits hepatic uptake of chylomicrons and VLDL. APOC1 inhibits hepatic uptake. What does that mean? It stops receptor-mediated endocytosis. APOC3 inhibits LPL. It stops them from dropping off fat. In those guys, you want to know the definition. You got to know the definition for those in case he asks you that. APOC1 stops hepatic uptake. It stops receptor-mediated endocytosis. APOC3 inhibits LPL. We're not going to talk about these guys much because there's not really much to talk about. But if we look down here, APOC2 activates LPL. APOC2 activates LPL, causing lipoprotein lipase to cleave lipids from the lipoproteins, allowing them to drop off fat. If they have APOC3, it inhibits LPL. They cannot drop off fat. 
The one thing I may mention that you probably won't get asked specifically, but just so you understand it, APOC1 inhibits hepatic uptake, which means that if this IDL bumps into the liver and doesn't get reabsorbed, it means that this guy that continued on to drop off more fat and become LDL might have APOC1, which is allowing him to hang out longer. So, this is a kid with a curfew. Mom's like, you got to be home at 10 o'clock. So he goes out, he drops off some fats, he plays with his friends, he does whatever, and then he has to go home at 10 o'clock. But this guy, the guy that continues on, his brother or something, is a much better talker. He's got APOC1. He's like, no, I don't need to come back, I got this excuse. And he continues on to play with his friends some more and drop off some more fat and become LDL. He must have APOC1 if he bumped into the liver because that inhibits hepatic uptake of that lipoprotein. So it lets him stay out and play longer. It lets him become LDL. All right. Questions on any of that? We're going to keep rolling through this. Okay, now I guess let's go back and look at some, some lovely words that I'm sure you guys want to look at. Chylomicrons are the largest, on page 41, chylomicrons are the largest of the lipoproteins with the lowest density. You know that. If they have the lowest density, they have the most fat or the least fat. They have the most fat, high TG content. They contain TGs. Lipo or chylomicrons carry TGs. Carita carrier of dietary fat to blood via lymph. So primarily via lymph. But Their major apoproteins are B48, C2, and E. We talked about them. B48, assembly and secretion of, di of fat and detection of LDL receptors. APOC2, activation of lipoprotein lipase, and APOE is the ligand for binding LDL receptors. That's what they have. That's the only three they have. That's all they care about. They pick up, they drop off, and they go back to home. Um, all this stuff is transported from the intestines to adipose tissue in the liver by chylomicrons. They carry dietary fats. They're hydrolyzed within a few minutes by lipase located in the capillaries, located in the tissues. Lipoprotein lipase is located in the tissues, producing chylomicron remnants simply a remnant of their former self. They're taken up by the liver. Chylomicron remnants are picked up by the liver, broken down, recycled. Chylomicrons are shipped back out, and the liver attaches the fats to VLDL. B48, assembly and secretion of TGs, and recognized by LDL receptors. We talked about that. C2 activates LPL. LPL is located in the membrane of the capillary endothelial cells. It's located at the tissues. It's not carried by the lipoproteins. Please make sure you know that. Lipoprotein lipase is located at the tissues in the capillary walls. APOC2 activates that enzyme. They don't carry the enzyme. Um, enzymatic action produces free fatty acids and glycerols and TGs from chylomicron, as well as chylomicron remnants. They're digested and lost, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, APOC2 is lost. Well, don't worry about that. They're released in the bloodstream and picked up by the tissues, the free fatty acids. We've talked about all this stuff. Down here, APOE serves as a ligand that binds, to L binds and detects LDL receptors, which are localized in the liver cell membrane. Fancy words, it triggers the clearance of VLDL and chylomicron remnants from the blood. It triggers clearance of VLDL and chylomicron remnants from the blood. Clearance meaning gets rid of them. We get rid of these guys by APOE binding the LDL receptors and receptor-mediated endocytosis. They're taken up by LDL receptors, and right at the bottom, receptor-mediated endocytosis. This used to be a fill-in-the-blank question. That's why we stress it. I don't think it showed up in my try, but it has showed up before, not as a fill-in-the-blank, but just as a TQ. They're absorbed by, at the liver by receptor-mediated endocytosis TQ. VLDLs, uh, they're converted to t fats and carbs from the diet are converted to TGs in the liver, and then they're packaged into VLDLs. The liver ships out VLDLs. They're also rich in triglycerides. Doesn't usually ask about them. Talked about ApoB100. ApoB100 is the same thing as ApoB48. It's just bigger. Assembly and secretion and detection of LDL receptors. C1 lets it stay out and play. C1 inhibits hepatic uptake. C2 activates LPL. Where is LPL located? In the tissues. C3 inhibits LPL means it's greedy. It doesn't want to give stuff up. And APOE binds to LDL receptors, allowing for 
ApoE binds to LDL receptors, allowing for receptor-mediated endocytosis. Receptor-mediated endocytosis. I know you guys are tired, but stay involved. A couple more minutes. Endogenously synthesized TGs are transported by VLDL. Dietary TGs are transported by chylomicron. They get to the liver, and then everything that the liver does with it, it packages into VLDL and ships it out. Enzymatic activities of lipoprotein lipase of the capillary endothelial of the capillary endothelial cells release TGs producing VLDL remnants or IDL. Just break some TGs off, it gets more, more dense, less fat, it becomes a remnant or it becomes an IDL. The free fatty acids are transported to the respective tissues for storage or oxidation. That's what we do, we drop it off. IDLs are rich in cholesterol esters because at this point they've dropped off a bunch of TGs. The VLDLs dropped off TGs, dropped off TGs, dropped off TGs. There's more cholesterol left. Again, doesn't usually ask you about this one. 50% of these IDLs are taken up by the liver by receptor-mediated endocytosis. The rest must have APOC1 because APOC1 inhibits hepatic uptake or they just never bump into the liver. So 50% are taken back up, 50% stay out to play. They're converted to LDLs by the loss of more TGs from lipoprotein lipase activity, which is activated by APOC2. And then LDLs are the major carriers of cholesterol. LDLs carry cholesterol and cholesterol esters. They're transporting cholesterol to peripheral tissues and regulating the de novo synthesis of cholesterol. They transport cholesterol to tissues and they regulate new synthesis of cholesterol. Because they carry cholesterol, if there's a lot of cholesterol, you don't produce cholesterol. If there's very little cholesterol, you produce cholesterol, negative feedback pathways. They're also used by macrophage... Oh, let me see. Yeah, you can know this if you want. It's for path and or micro. I don't remember which. LDLs are picked up by macrophages and oxidized and turned into free radicals. And then the macrophages become what's called a foam cell. And the foam cell starts shooting free radicals at bacteria. When your phagocytes can't handle bacterial infections, these guys pick up an oxidized LDL, make free radicals, and use it as a cannon to kill bacteria. Now, that's bad because we're making free radicals in our body, but it's good because it takes care of the bacteria. So, if you want that for micro or path, you're welcome to. <laughs> All right. Um, let's talk about atherosclerosis. So, these guys drop off cholesterol. Now, please realize that this is a normal system. We drop it off at the tissues where we need it, right? What happens if you eat too much fat? What happens if your liver's shipping out massive amounts of VLDL, massive amounts of triglycerides and cholesterols to deal with your dietary consumption of fats and refined carbohydrates? Because remember, carbohydrates can be broken down to acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA can be synthesized into fat. So even if you're like, I don't eat a lot of fat. I eat a ton of refined carbohydrates. I eat sugar and flour out the wazoo. I can still make fats and cholesterols out of that. I can still ship it out to the tissues. Well, when it gets shipped out, normally it drops it off at tissues that need it. What happens if you run out of tissues that need it? It starts dropping it off wherever the hell it feels like it. It drops it off in your blood vessels and it sticks to the walls. It creates plaque in your blood vessels, atherosclerosis. So, if you have either a genetic problem or some congenital problem or some sort of problem with with the, the synthesis of these guys and they're producing too many, or if your diet is rich in refined carbohydrates and fats, and you produce too many, you will start seeing plaque building up in your arterial wall because your, your body is just dropping off these things wherever it can. Your body is just dropping off fats and cholesterols wherever it can. It's getting rid of them. That's atherosclerosis when it builds up in your blood vessel. You go into a lot more detail than that in past. All right. Now we're going to go back and we're going to talk about HDL real quick. HDL is also synthesized at the liver. Oh, actually, I'm sorry. Let's look at... Mm, yeah, let's look at HDL first. HDL is also synthesized at the liver, but HDL has a special name. HDL is responsible for reverse cholesterol transport. HDL is reverse cholesterol transport. What that means is HDL rolls out from the liver, goes to the tissues and says, you don't need cholesterol, picks it back up, and takes it back to the liver and says, take this back, get this out of my body. 
HDL is the good cholesterol, if you've ever heard it called that, HDL is the good cholesterol, because it picks up peripheral cholesterol and takes it back to the liver. HDL is primarily a transporter of cholesterol, as is LDL. So what HDL does is HDL comes out here, gets shipped out from the liver, and it rolls out here, and it's like, I'm going to scoop up some, some cholesterol from here, and I'm going to scoop up some cholesterol from here, and now I'm in HDL with cholesterol. As HDL scoops up cholesterol, does it become more dense or less dense? As HDL scoops up cholesterol, it becomes less dense because it's picking up fat. HDL is reverse cholesterol transport. It keeps your body free of floating and pathological cholesterol. The more HDL you have, the healthier you are. We we'll study that a lot in nutrition. Now, HDL does a couple of things. One, it takes this stuff back to the liver. It's dropped off. It's absorbed. It's broken down. It's recycled and shipped back out, just like everything else. Or two, it takes these cholesterols and it makes cholesterol esters. It takes these cholesterols and it makes cholesterol esters. What enzyme in chapter 3 took cholesterol to cholesterol ester? At a four-letter abbreviation, last step of cholesterol biosynthesis. ACAT. ACAT is acyl cholesterol, something like that. It's cholesterol transferase or something like that. Acyl cholesterol, acyl cholesterol transferase, whatever, ACAT. This guy doesn't have ACAT. He doesn't have acyl cholesterol, acyl transferase. He has lecithin cholesterol, acyl transferase. He has LCAT. LCAT is present in HDL. LCAT takes cholesterol and turns cholesterol into cholesterol esters. What are cholesterol esters? Storage form of cholesterol. HDL takes cholesterol and turns it into cholesterol esters. I'm HDL takes it. It's LCAT. Its enzyme is LCAT. ACAT is in cholesterol biosynthesis. It's probably present in the liver where we make cholesterol. HDL doesn't carry ACAT around. It carries LCAT. The only difference between ACAT and LCAT is LCAT is bound to HDL. Same enzymatic activity. It's just bound to HDL. Then what does this guy do? This guy has an enzyme that transfers cholesterol esters to LDL. He makes the storage form, and then he gives them to LDL. And he's like, you deal with it. You take it back to the liver. I'm going to go on picking stuff up and doing whatever. So that LDL may drop off that cholesterol ester at the tissue, or it may roll it back to the liver, where it gets recycled, broken down, and sent back out. HDL is reverse cholesterol transport. Any questions about the basics? We're going to go through its APO enzymes next. Okay? If you look up at the top, we need to deal with the rest of them, which is APOA1 and APOD. Now, please note that HDL still assembles, secretes, and detects LDL receptors, so it has ApoB100. Um, it has ApoC2, so it can cleave off L fats. It has to be able to activate lipoprotein lipase, which is present at the tissues, so it can drop off fats if it needs to. And it has um, ApoE, which is how it gets back into the liver by receptor-mediated endocytosis. I'm not sure if it has ApoC3. I can't find any information on it, so it might. Don't worry about it. Primarily, your TQs are going to come from the big boys. They all have C2. They all have E. They all have one of the Bs. And you need to know the ones that HDL is the only one that has. A1 and D are present only on HDL. A1 and D are present only on HDL. ApoA1 activates lecithin cholesterol acyltransferase, LCAT. What does LCAT do? Makes cholesterol esters. LCAT, all the cats so far, all the cats so far make cholesterol esters. LCAT activates cholesterol, uh, uh, I'm sorry, ApoA1 activates LCAT, LCAT makes cholesterol esters. And then what does the HDL do with the cholesterol esters that he made? What did I say he did? He gives them to LDL. So he's got an apoprotein that does that. ApoD is cholesterol ester transfer protein, C-E-T-P, cholesterol ester transfer protein. And that's ApoD. And that allows HDL to give his cholesterol esters to LDL. This is the list you've got to memorize for this chapter. They're not hard once you get them down. You understand what they do. There's a couple of abbreviations, but it's no big deal. ApoA1 activates LCAT. LCAT is on HDL. HDL makes cholesterol esters, and then it uses ApoD. 
ApoD is cholesterol ester transfer protein, which allows it, that HDL to transfer cholesterol ester to LDL. Okay, questions? We got one more layer to add to this baby. Sorry for this. No big deal, though. So we've talked about all these apoproteins. You need to know, and it says this right up here. Anyone know what nascent means? Newborn. Nascent means newborn. These guys are only present when they're nascent. Whoops. So over here, you're going to notice, when I squeeze this whole thing on here, that when these guys are born, when they are synthesized de novo from the liver and the VLDLs are shipped out, the only thing the VLDL has is ApoB100. VLDL rolls out with ApoB100. That's it. How? It needs ApoE and it needs ApoC2, but they're not present when they roll out from the liver. Cool with that concept. Chylomicrons only have ApoB48. They're the only ones that are present when they roll out from the liver. HDLs are synthesized with ApoB100, ApoA1, and ApoD. Those guys are all present to my knowledge. So, one thing that we didn't talk about with the HDLs was the HDLs roll out and they pick up peripheral cholesterol, they pick up peripheral triglycerides, whatever. They pick up stuff from the tissues, they're reverse cholesterol transport, but they also pick up IDLs and LDLs. They're the dump trucks. They're the, they pick up VLDL remnants. So, they roll out and they scoop up VLDL remnants and they chuck them on them and they take them back wherever. They take them back to the liver, they deal with their fats, they do whatever. In the process of picking up VLDL remnants, they pick up apoproteins because the apoproteins are present on the VLDL remnant. So when the HDLs digest VLDL remnants, they become a reservoir of apoproteins. Primarily, what we care about is C2 and E. HDLs become a reservoir of apoproteins upon digesting VLDL remnants. When they do that, they mature themselves. Because remember, HDLs don't come out with ApoC2 and ApoE either. They're nascent. They're newborn. They can't drop stuff off. They want to be able to drop stuff off. So they go out, they scoop up some VLDL remnants, they get them on, they get their apoproteins, they go from nascent to mature HDLs. Now, they scoop up more than one, which means they have multiple copies of this. ApoC2 and ApoE are stored by HDL. They are a reservoir for ApoC2 and ApoE. And they go over and they bump into a nascent VLDL and they donate an ApoC2 and an ApoE, and they mature nascent VLDL into mature VLDL by giving them their apoproteins. They go over and they bump into a nascent chylomicron that only has ApoB48, and they give it an, ApoB, an ApoC2 and an ApoE. They mature nascent VLDLs and they mature nascent chylomicrons. Does that make sense? This is the last layer, I promise. We're going to go through a couple pages and you guys are out of here. Um, APO, HDL picks up VLDL remnants, IDLs, LDLs, etc., scoops them up, digests them, deals with their fats. It might go back to the liver and get digested, or it stores all those APO proteins. When it picks up all those guys, it matures itself because, remember, it still needs APO C2 and E. It matures itself from nascent HDL to mature HDL. It also is going to bump into nascent VLDLs and nascent chylomicrons on its journey around the body. When it bumps into those guys, any air extra copies of ApoB C2 and ApoE, it gives to them, and it matures nascent VLDLs by donating ApoC2 and ApoE. It matures nascent chylomicrons by donating ApoC2 and ApoE. So they now have their full complement of apoproteins, and they can go on to do their job. Questions? We've been through this like four times. I know it's a lot, but this is... A in my experience, the best way to teach this is not to throw it all at you at once, but to get you through it a couple times. So HDLs, we'll go through a couple pages, are produced by the liver and the intestine as a small molecule. They're nascent. They contain less phospholipids, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They don't contain ApoC or ApoE. They have ApoB100. Uh, mature HDL serves as the repository, the reservoir for C2 and E for nascent chylomicrons and VLDLs, and in turn converts them to mature VLDLs and mature chylomicrons. should say chylomicrons, not LDL. Mm. 45. 
HDL serves as the repository. It digests these extra VLDL remnants. It picks up APOC2 and APOE. It bumps into nascent chylomicrons and nascent VLDL and converts them to mature chylomicrons and mature VLDL by donating APOC2 and APOE, which they lack and they need to be mature. HDL picks up cholesterol released into the plasma from dying cells and membranes and returns it to the liver. It also receives APOC2 and APOE following VLDL digestion. So it digests these guys, it picks up their apoproteins, it picks up free cholesterol, it saves your tissues, it reverses that stuff. Therefore, it's known as reverse cholesterol transport. It's your good cholesterol, it's your dense cholesterol. An acyl transferase is known as lecithin cholesterol acyl transferase or LCAT. It sterifies these cholesterols. LCAT is activated by APOA1. HDLs have APOA1. It activates LCAT. They take cholesterol. They turn it into the storage form, cholesterol ester, which is a sterified with a fatty acid at the hydroxyl group of position 3. A sterified cholesterol is then rapidly shuttied to VLDL or LDL by the transfer protein CETP, cholesterol ester transferase protein, transfer protein, which is APOD down here at the bottom. HDLs either directly transport them to the liver or they transfer them to other lipoproteins known by CETP, a.k.a. APOD. The major role is reverse cholesterol transport. The major role of HDL is reverse cholesterol transport. What's that mean? It picks up extra cholesterol from the extra hepatic tissue and takes it back to the liver. It's good cholesterol. Reduces plasma cholesterols and removes cholesterols from foam cells, which are free radicals, which can do damage. Foam cells are also responsible for atherosclerosis and primarily the clotting and the, the hemorrhage that results in infarcts and embolistic strokes when you have a clot. Nascent chylomicrons only contain APO B, APO48, B48. It does not contain C2 or E. It gets C2 or E. Mature HDL contains C2 and E, serves as a repository. It donates C2 and E to nascent chylomicrons, nascent VLDL, which matures them, converts them to mature chylomicrons, mature VLDL, following APOC2 and E from HDL. Uh,